the struggle for survival in water has lasted for hundreds of millions of years. But sooner or later, the battlefield always changes. Living organisms have always been in search of a better environment for their habitat, one where it would be easier for them to reproduce, grow and develop. At one point in history, living organisms made the decision to drastically change their place of existence. This radical change allowed them to inhabit the place where we now reside. But it took millions of years to reach the planet we see today. Back then, the land of the planet was desolate. All life existed beneath the water's surface. Everything began to change. The Devonian extinction forced living beings to abandon the decaying aquatic environment for more oxygen-rich places. This place was land. Yet even before the Devonian extinction, life already existed on it. One such life form was Trentopolia, filamentous algae resembling moss. Structurally similar plants were the first to test their strength over a billion years ago, attempting to emerge onto land. To successfully settle on land, they needed to protect themselves from dehydration. To do this, they developed a cuticle, a protective layer on the surface of plants that provides a moist environment for their interiors. Such a protective structure made the plant walls very thick, providing a reserve of nutrients. Fungi followed suit. They were undemanding organisms, feeding on various waste materials, which allowed them to be called heterotrophic organisms. In fact, they were the first scavengers on the Earth's land. It was very difficult for plants of that time to survive because they lacked roots capable of absorbing nutrients. To overcome this, plants began to use thin, filamentous structures called rhizoids. These allowed them to grip the soil more firmly, obtain nutrients from it, and be less susceptible to winds. At that time, plants and fungi worked in tandem. But time passed, and epochs changed. 480 million years ago, the oldest plant appeared on our planet, a plant that still possesses unique survivability, moss. Today, these plants comprise about 13,000 species, but back then, they were much less numerous. Mostly inhabiting swampy areas, they reproduced well through spores. They lacked flowers, roots, and a vascular system. But despite their ordinary description, mosses were incredibly important for our planet. This green carpet covering the Earth's surface plays a key role in regulating the landscape's water balance. They acted as water carriers from water bodies into the depths of forests, since they had an excellent ability to absorb and retain large amounts of water. Mosses allowed the plant world of our planet to expand beyond the shores of seas and oceans. They were conduits from water to land, in a world where plants had yet to conquer dominance through strenuous adaptation. All further development of the organic world followed the path of adaptation to this new and much more complex environment. Now plants had to learn to obtain nutrients solely from soil and sunlight, as well as become stronger to give themselves stability. 440 million years ago, primitive vascular plants appeared on land. They are the ancestors of all plants on Earth.
The Carboniferous period was a true dawn for all life on our planet. It witnessed an increase in oxygen levels worldwide. The climate became warmer and wetter. In the conditions of a humid tropical climate that prevailed on Earth at that time, forests of fern-like plants began to flourish. Lepidodendrons and sigillarias formed the basis of gigantic club mosses. These trees reached heights of 30 meters, with a trunk diameter of up to two meters, topped with a crown of leaves where reproduction occurred. An essential element of these plants was their developed root structure, which allowed them to grow so tall by providing a large supply of necessary nutrients. During this epoch, densely vegetated forested areas formed in many regions of the earth. These forests predominantly developed along water bodies' shores or in swamps. They produced a vast amount of wood, which, after plant decay, remained in place, sinking into water or marshy soil, where complete decomposition of plant mass did not occur. Evolving over millions of years, these forests generated a vast amount of buried plant material, forming much of the Earth's coal deposits. It was these flourishing forests that began to be inhabited by animals. The most adaptable among them were arthropods. To completely change their habitat, animals needed special characteristics that would allow them to survive. One of the most important elements was the presence of a hard shell. While in water, the density of water helped them, but upon emerging onto land, they immediately clung to the ground. Another crucial element was their body's ability not to dry out. After all, in water, they didn't need to retain additional moisture in their bodies. Whereas on land, they could easily dry out under the scorching sun. In such complex adaptation conditions, trilobites were the first to colonize the Earth's surface. They were perfect candidates for the first inhabitants of our planet. Having a hard exoskeleton, which simultaneously made their bodies hard and prevented dehydration, they gradually began to emerge from the water. But it can't be said that the transition was painless for them. The new terrain forced them to adapt to conditions for which they were definitely not prepared. The number of species of those who emerged from water onto land at that time was quite wide. Some representatives, although trilobites, resembled completely different creatures. For example, scorpions. Some of them had tentacles, which allowed them to hunt successfully. Others were not even gifted with sight by nature, but were endowed with impressive sizes. This giant millipede could reach lengths of two meters. Its dense outer shell allowed it to feel completely protected. Unfortunately, they were completely blind. Desiring to find a mate, they were forced to search for her only by her scent trail left by the female earlier. The journey could be long and exhausting. But the end justifies the means. The female is found. And they, rearing up, performing their usual ritual, can begin to reproduce. Millipedes were magnificent inhabitants of the Carboniferous period. But there were also inhabitants whose existence is difficult to explain, as they did not have dense skeletons. However, their incredible lightness and, at the same time, the tenacity of their legs allowed them to firmly grip the surface. These were spiders. Their predecessors are chelicerates, small aquatic creatures resembling modern ticks. Spiders originated from them. They did not differ much from their aquatic relatives and were quite small, no larger than a fingertip phalanx. Giant spiders, like bird-eating spiders, wouldn't emerge for hundreds of millions of years. But all spiders share one common feature, a love for dancing. Strangely enough, it originated 300 million years ago. It's the peacock spider. His gaze caught a beautiful female. With such large eyes relative to body size, it's not hard to do. The need to attract her attention prompts him to start dancing. His rhythmic movements and swaying from side to side bore fruit. He caught her attention, but apparently she wasn't impressed.
another attempt. And all in vain, it's time to flee. Female spiders are somewhat similar to female mantises, as they also attack males, but in our case, even before mating. Spiders of that time were incredibly beautiful. As they originated from marine animals, they had a similar coloration, allowing them to be the diamonds of the Carboniferous period. Spiders were terrestrial predators and preferred to live in gigantic club moss and fern forests. Their main prey were arthropods. They were already capable of producing silk at that time. Perhaps its main purpose was to protect eggs. But soon, it became an excellent tool for creating hanging homes and transportation. Moreover, the spider's adept ability to weave webs came in handy for feeding. It can be said that spiders were the first to invent traps. Well-woven spider silk could catch other creatures off guard. This allowed spiders to instantly turn the caught creature into prey, and these creatures were often insects. But did you know that there were creatures that were so fast that their brains simply couldn't keep up with their movements in space? It's the tiger beetle, the fastest beetle ever to exist on our planet, but unfortunately, very foolish. In pursuit of its goal, it finds it difficult to orient itself in space. Unlike the Tenizidae, it calmly waits in ambush. A moment, and the race for life is over. The evolution of terrestrial inhabitants forced other creatures to conquer the air. While there was still no competition there, insects, presumably they originated from a small crustacean that inhabited the water or from millipedes. In any case, these Earth inhabitants occupied an important niche on our planet. Most insects were small, unable to travel long distances. Others had a kind of gigantism. Externally, insects resemble arthropods with wings. This makes them versatile creatures, allowing them to enjoy the benefits of both the aerial and terrestrial environments. Their diet is incredibly diverse and varies from species to species. Some prefer to eat smaller insects, while others like to feast on wood or grain. There are those who love to eat green plants. During evolution, some insects became a huge problem for certain plant species. It's the cicada, a medium or large-sized insect. Their wings are twice the size of their bodies. This makes them excellent flyers. Evolution has given them a frightening sing capable of scaring anyone. Just listen. and this warns us of their danger. Joining together in a real swarm, cicadas can completely devour any field in their path. There is no panacea for them. Eating field after field, cicadas leave the ground. And for 17 years, they don't come out to the surface. But millions of years ago, there were no cicadas yet. Then, most representatives belonged to the orders of dragonflies, orthoptera, or cockroaches. But during the Carboniferous period, it wasn't just the land that thrived. The aquatic world was also actively developing. Corals were becoming more abundant. They turned the entire aquatic world into a place of incredible beauty. The water literally shimmered with their bright colors. But they not only had decorative purposes, but also served as homes for fish during hibernation. Mollusks were actively evolving, especially gastropods and nautiloids. The flora of the underwater world was also keeping pace. 
Underwater plants were developing in large numbers. Algae were becoming more abundant and they were growing longer. This allowed them to receive more sunlight, enriching the seas with more oxygen as a result. Underwater flowers appeared, such as sea lilies. During this period, lobed finned fishes occupied an important place. Some of them can rightly be called giant predators. In a world where the rules are very simple and only the strongest survive, being large is almost the only way to stay safe. But those that were slightly smaller had to inhabit shallow waters. Their lobed fins were perfectly suited for such environments. Unlike other fish of that time, lobed finned fishes had strong enough fins. They not only allowed them to swim over various distances, but were also strong enough to support the weight of their own bodies. And they wanted to test their strength and attempt to venture out of the water. Slowly but surely, their attempt begins to materialize. Thanks to primitive lungs, lobed finned fishes were also able to breathe on land. And here it is, the solid, sandy shore. they were late. Other creatures had already transitioned to land. These are amphibians. They were already awaiting their guests on the shore. And now, the fish will become the prey of this anthracosaur. The anthracosaur could reach a length of three meters, and its skull was about 40 centimeters long. It was the largest amphibian of that time. But not only such giants belonged to this class. Amphibians diversified and became the dominant terrestrial vertebrates in the Carboniferous period. They include newts, salamanders, and frogs. Most of them reproduce in water, but they prefer to live on land. Some of them prefer to eat fruits, but the majority are content with consuming only animals. This river is the habitat of a large number of terrestrial creatures. Among them are frogs, one of the main representatives of amphibians. They are in search of prey, and their favorite food is dragonflies. All dragonflies feed on insects caught in flight, but now she wants to lay eggs, and they develop only in a watery environment. She is forced to visit the swamp. Flying over it, she becomes a target for pond frogs. With their powerful legs, which allow them to jump high out of the water, she tries to catch her target, but missed. The dragonfly has excellent maneuvering abilities, but still decides to land on the water. Here, she becomes vulnerable to persistent and tenacious frogs. Frogs, like other representatives of amphibians, have always lived near water bodies. There, they could reach the peak of their development and make their lives easier. Being primary predators, frogs were good hunters. Their diet often consisted of dragonflies aquatic beetles, or the larvae of small mollusks. If there were problems with finding these creatures, frogs would eat tadpoles of their own species, as well as feed on fish fry. Their excellent hunting abilities were also aided by their coloration. Their camouflage skin served as an excellent means of disguise. They literally blended in with the colors of marsh and lake plants and were practically invisible from a bird's eye view. These are representatives of the tree-climbing family. Even by their name, it's clear that they spend most of their lives in trees, up to 10 meters high. Their bodies are well adapted to moving along thin branches and even leaves. Their large and wide feet, relative to their bodies, have three toes that help them distribute weight across the entire width of the foot. But they only reproduce in water. The tadpoles of this female are in mortal danger. The place of their reproduction has almost dried up, and the only way to survive is to climb onto the mother's back. She knows exactly where to look for water. After all, 20 meters above her, a bromelia collects rainwater. 
this place is perfectly suitable for the development of her tadpoles. Slowly but surely, she climbs up the tall tree. Step by step, jumping higher and higher, she increases her chances of saving her child. This ascent for her is a struggle for life. Finally, her goal is achieved, and she can rest easy knowing her child is safe. Evolved from ancient lobe-finned fishes, amphibians have survived on our planet for over 300 million years. But despite their longevity and ability to adapt and survive, even during times of global extinctions, amphibians have never been able to conquer the entire planet. The reason for this is their attachment to water. Throughout their existence, they have never been able to stray from their native habitat, and they continue to live only near bodies of water. The world of the Carboniferous period was a beautiful place for the development of all living creatures. 300 million years ago, the oxygen level in the atmosphere was 35%. Such a high value is explained by the fact that dead trees did not fully decompose, with their carbon transforming into CO2, but were buried in swampy areas, turning into deposits of coal. This happened because, during the Carboniferous period, fungi and microorganisms had not yet developed enzymes capable of effectively decomposing linen, which is part of wood. The high level of oxygen in the atmosphere allowed all living things to reproduce and thrive. At the same time, huge land masses began to merge with each other. In this process, one large supercontinent formed called Pangaea. Despite the favorable climatic conditions, they significantly influenced the surface of the land. The active development of plants had a lot of positive elements, but also had its downsides. The more plants there were, the more they needed water. But water is not an infinite resource, especially fresh water, such as in swamps. It was these areas that provided the necessary water for all the flora of that time. Excessive consumption of water by plants led to the gradual drying up of swamps. This, in turn, negatively affected the living beings that inhabited the vicinity of swamps. Amphibians were literally forced to either migrate to more watery places or become extinct. In an attempt to adapt to the changing world, amphibians had to find another way to continue their species, a way that would not require water for the development of their offspring, and they found it. Some amphibians developed a truly revolutionary ability that allowed them to live and thrive for millions more years. This is egg laying, but not the same ones as before, but eggs that had a strong protective shell that kept the embryo in a separate position with liquid. Liquid, which is essential for development. This allowed them not to fear drying out and to some extent made them independent of water. This type of egg is called an amniotic egg. Amniotes are a clade of tetrapods. Emerging about 320 million years ago, they became the ancestors of all mammals, birds, reptiles, and dinosaurs. Literally 50 million years later, they became the main representatives of our Earth and completely populated it. Amniotes are divided into two clades, the struggle between which continues to this day. These are synapsids and diapsids. Later, humans originated from synapsids. Thanks to the amniotic egg, most of all living creatures appeared on Earth. These giants, covered with armor, are a primitive type of reptile. Scutosaurus are one of the largest terrestrial animals. Reaching a length of three meters and weighing over a ton, they were the first herbivorous giants to inhabit our planet. By laying eggs, they reproduced in a drier environment and inhabited previously unexplored lands. These parareptiles had a stocky body protected from predators by a shell consisting of a neck shield and individual osteoderms. But Pangaea did not belong to them alone. Another new dynasty arose, a dynasty that would later give rise to all mammals. One of the representatives of this dynasty was the Lystrosaurus, being on average about one meter long and having no strong body protection, the Lystrosaurus was no match for Scutosaurus. 
and it fed on completely different things, namely horsetails and other plants. And its fangs were most likely used for digging in the ground or digging up plant roots. But this animal has larger relatives, namely the Gorgonops. It was significantly larger than the Lystrosaurus. Being over three meters long and weighing 300 kilograms, it was a worthy opponent for any creature living at that time. They had a keen sense of smell, allowing them to detect their prey over long distances. But more importantly, they also had large and powerful teeth, which were also quite sharp. Additionally, they had massive tusks on the sides, resembling those of saber-toothed tigers. Such tusks allowed the Gorgonops to capture prey whose skin was slippery. Quietly approaching its prey, it closes in on the moment of battle. But it is important to find the best time for a lightning-fast attack. This is the key to victory and the key to life. During this period, the ancestors of all lizards also emerged. Their variety was not very large at that time, but they were practically no different from modern ones. One of them was the Gillenom. It grew up to 25 centimeters in length and had small, thin teeth. Like most lizards, they were carnivorous. They fed on insects, worms, or arachnids. The struggle for dominance on land between mammals and reptiles did not cease on the entire planet for hundreds of millions of years. They competed not only among themselves, but also with nature, adapting to the conditions it creates. And 250 million years ago, it created conditions under which very few living beings could adapt. The dawn of all dynasties was short-lived, as the most massive extinction event on our planet occurred an extinction event that was 30% more massive than any other extinction ever. To this day, there is no unified explanation for the reasons for those events. Some scientists even attribute the collision of an asteroid with the Earth as the cause. But the most common cause is volcanic activity. The molten underworld, forgotten by all living things for millions of years, never sleeps. It only waits for the moment to show its power again. And this time, it showed its power 250 million years ago. This event is called the Permian-Triassic Mass Extinction. Deep in the Earth, boiling magma gradually approached higher and higher. Near the Siberian traps, this process was particularly active. As the magma approached higher and higher, it counted down to the global death of all living things. And as soon as the first eruptions began, all life was doomed, as it could no longer be stopped. It was one of the largest volcanic eruptions in the entire history of the Earth. Tons of molten lava spread across the surface in different parts of the planet. They raged for 130,000 years and devastated a huge part of our planet. It was covered in molten magma, forming a crust on which nothing living could grow for a long time. Large emissions of sulfur dioxide and carbon dioxide caused acidification of the world's oceans, as well as a rise in global temperatures. Methane emissions into the atmosphere only exacerbated global warming, since methane in the atmosphere retains heat much more effectively than carbon dioxide. Disruption of the ecosystem led to millions of deaths of animals and plants. The rise in temperature led to additional greenhouse effects. Vapor, which used to consist of familiar chemical elements, now resembled an acidic cocktail. Sulfur and methane began to spread, not only in regions where there was the most eruption, but also in those regions where there was none. Rain clouds began to scatter around the planet, bringing death to all regions. Tree leaves began to dry out rapidly, and once sturdy trunks began to melt from the effects of harmful rains. Their roots ceased to hold the large trees, and they began to fall. 
the soil of the earth became unsuitable for the growth of new plants. The toxic effect literally scorched the earth, preventing anything new from sprouting. But death lurked not only within visible bounds, partly it was invisible. The increase in carbon dioxide was ten times greater than it is now, and a large number of animals perished from suffocation, not even understanding what was happening to them. Various extreme weather conditions began to rage on the planet at that time. Some areas experienced droughts, while others faced floods. It was absolutely impossible to prepare for such events. As a result of this mass extinction, more than 80% of all insect species perished. Around 70% of all terrestrial species became extinct in just 60,000 years. Almost all plants, regardless of their size, were destroyed. But life in the water suffered even more. Nearly 90% of all aquatic creatures, especially those inhabiting shallow seas, lakes and swamps, were wiped off the face of the earth forever. Oxygen, which was so crucial for the development of all aquatic life, practically disappeared, destroying everything living there. Many species of fish and arthropods, including trilobites, vanished. It took about 30 million years for the biosphere to fully recover after the mass extinction. However, a significant portion recovered much faster, within just five million years. The extinction of old forms paved the way for many animals that had long remained in the shadows. A new period in the history of our planet dawned, the Triassic period. It paved the way for creatures that were not as developed before. It was a period of preparation for the colonization of the planet by the largest creatures ever to inhabit our planet. And we'll talk about this in the next video. Subscribe to the channel and be sure to like this video to continue learning the answers to the mysteries of our planet.